You are listening to Proof Text, a Glossa House podcast exploring scripture and all things related to it. New episodes are released daily. For more information, check out glossahouse.com and subscribe to our channels on Spotify and YouTube. Welcome and enjoy. Friends, hello and welcome to Proof Text and Glossa House TV. I'm Dr. T. Michael Obia Halcom, and this is an episode of a Hebrew reading, Hebrew vocabulary, and following that, a great episode of Christ and Classics where they're talking about homeschooling and Christian education. So stay tuned for those other two segments following this one. But like I said, this is uh, Hebrew readings, and we've been working just word by word, verse by verse through Malachi in Hebrew, and that's what we're doing again here. So if you have a Hebrew Testament and you want to grab that, we're going to look at Malachi 1, 11 today and read it in Hebrew. And uh, if you want to uh, just watch, that's fine too. If you're just listening, as always, that's okay. But I'm going to put the uh, Hebrew text up on the screen, and we're going to be able to see it here and engage it a bit. Um, so, oh, uh, I haven't read this yet. This is kind of a cold reading, but wow, that's a pretty long verse. So let's get to it. Here we go. A ki mi mizrach. Ki mimizrach, ki mimizrach shemesh, ki mimizrach shemesh, the ad, the ad, ki mimizrach shemesh, the ad. And then we have m, v, v, a, o. All right, so that's kind of tricky. The ad, m, v, a, o. Ki mimizrak shemesh vaad m voao gadol m voao gadol m voao gadol. So we have vaad m voao gadol shemi shemi ki mimizrak shemesh vaad m voao gadol shemi v. Goim, uh, sorry, ba, goim, goim, ba, goim, sorry, ba, goim, goim, shemi, ba, goim, ki, mi, mizrak, shemesh, vaad, mavoa, o, gadol, shemi, ba, goim, and then we have v, or sorry, u, bakal, u, vakal, u, vakal, so we have uh, b goim u vakal makom makom b goim u vakal makom mukatar mukatar makom mukatar mugash mukatar mugash mukatar mugash. So we have uh several m words here right makum makum makatar magash lashmi u mincha u mincha tahura tahura kigadol so u mincha tahura kigadol shmi bagoyim amar yahweh sevaot and remember, a lot of people will treat that T there at the end, like a TH, Sevaoth. Um, I don't necessarily do that. So one more time through. Ki mi mizra shemesh vaad mavua'u gadol shemi bagoyim u vakal makum makatar magash gadol shemi. Sorry, I hit the button there. Um, let me start over. Ki mimizrach shemesh vaad mavoa'o gadol, did it again, gadol shemi bagoyim uvakal makum makatar magash la shemi u mincha tahora ki gadol shemi bagoyim amar yahweh sabaot. Let's try it with the pointings off here. The nickel demon dagashim off and see how we do. All right, let's do it down. All 
All right, there we go. All right. Kimi misrak shemesh va'ad mavua gadol shemi v'goyim v'goyim u'v'kal makom makatar ma magesh la shemi u'mincha tachora ki gadol shemi v'goyim amar Yahweh sevaot. I find this so much easier <laughs> to read without the the vowel pointings. Uh, it's so much faster um, and just smoother. Ki mi misrak shemesh va'ad mavuah gadol shemi bagayim uvakal makum makatar magesh la shemi umicha taharoa ki gadol shemi bagayim amar Yahweh shavaot. So much easier. Um, so let's go back and uh, turn the pointings on one more time and give it another go. I really encourage you uh, to, to practice reading this way with and without them. Um, all right, so ki mi mizrak shemesh va'ad mavua'u gadol shemi bagoyim uvakal makum makatar magash la shemi the mincha taharoa ki gadol shemi bagoyim amar Yahweh sevaot. Not too shabby. Um, others are better than me, but I I love getting these reps in, this practice in. Um, I find you know uh, if I away from it for a while, I'm a little rusty when I come back, but it always sort of seems to come back um, after I've practiced a little bit more. So um, encourage you again to read out loud with and without the dots, all right? All right, hey, stay tuned for the Hebrew vocabulary segment following this, and then Christ and Classics following that. All right, here we go. Friends, hello, and welcome to Proof Text and Glossal House TV. I'm Dr. T. Michael W. Halcom, and uh, this uh, is a Hebrew vocabulary segment, and following this, we have a Christ and Classics segment coming up that's talking about a homeschooling and classical Christian education. Hope you enjoyed um, the segment before this, the Hebrew reading, where we're reading word by word, verse by verse through Malachi. Um, all right, so Hebrew vocabulary, we're going to open up stepbible.org here and uh, do a quick search and see what we can turn up with regard to the Hebrew term room. Room. Um, and this means to be exalted, to be lifted up on high kind of thing, um, or to be high up there, right? Um, so room, if you think of, uh, I guess, a mnemonic device for this, like you walk into uh, a very spacious room and there's a throne in there, like a king who's exalted. Um, yeah, so that's one mnemonic device. Take it or leave it. So let's do a quick search here. Um, Boom, there we go. And you can see to exalt, all these have to do with height. To exalt, height, to rise, height, height. Again, so let's look at this one, exalt. You see the first, um, to rise, uh, also to be lifted up, to exalt. Um, this is the first occurrence of this in Genesis 7, 17. We have, Vataram, it's an interesting form from that. Um, so remember in, in Hebrew when you have, uh, uh, you know, sometimes the R will, well, when, I, when you're dealing with uh, things like imperfect tenses, you'll have the prefixes on there and uh, letters will, letters, it doesn't have anything to do with the rish, but sometimes letters will be added, sometimes letters will drop out based on prefixes and suffixes and infixes and these sorts of things. So. Um, just be aware of that. So you can look over here and see that in Genesis 14, 22, which is perfective rather than imperfect, um, you have no uh, tav at the beginning there. So, But here you do have um, tav in the ending, t. So har, uh, harimo, harimoti, harimoti. Um, in Genesis 31, 45, uh, vairimeha. Varimeha. 
And then 3915, Harimoti. Harimoti in 3918, Ka Harimi. Ka Harimi. And 4144, Lo Yarim. Lo Yarim. I like the sound of that. Um, Exodus, I just like the sound. Um, Exodus 720, we have Vayarem. Uh, and Exodus 14.8, Ramah. So that's interesting. We know the place name, Ramah. And then 14.16, Exodus, uh, Harem. Harem. So again, these have to do with uh, exalt, lift it up, rising, be set on high, so on and so forth. Um, interesting word. So yeah, that's it for now. We have a Christ in Classics episode coming up next. So stay tuned for that. Here we go. Friends, hello and welcome to Proof Text and Glossal House TV. I'm Dr. T. Michael W. Halcom, and uh, this uh, is a Hebrew vocabulary segment. And following this, we have a Christ in Classics segment coming up that's talking about uh, homeschooling and classical Christian education. Hope you enjoyed um, the segment before this, the Hebrew reading, where we're reading word by word, verse by verse through Malachi. Um, all right, so Hebrew vocabulary, we're going to open up stepbible.org here and uh, do a quick search and see what we can turn up with regard to the Hebrew term room, room. Um, and this means to be exalted, to be lifted up on high kind of thing, um, or to be high up there, right? Um, so room, if you think of, uh, I guess, a mnemonic device for this, like you walk into uh, a very spacious room, and there's a throne in there, like a king who's exalted. Um, yeah, so that's one mnemonic device. Take it or leave it. So let's do a quick search here. Um, room. There we go. And you can see to exalt, all these have to do with height. To exalt, height, to rise, height, height. Again, so let's look at this one exalt. You see the first um, to rise, uh, also to be lifted up, to exalt. Um, this is the first occurrence of this in Genesis 7.17. We have vataram. It's an interesting form from that. Um, so remember in, in Hebrew when you have, uh, uh, you know, sometimes the R will, well, when, I, when you're dealing with, uh, things like imperfect tenses, you'll have the prefixes on there, and uh, letters will, letters, doesn't have anything to do with the rish, but sometimes letters will be added, sometimes letters will drop out based on prefixes and suffixes and infixes and these sorts of things. So um, just be aware of that. So you can look over here and see that in Genesis 14.22, which is perfective rather than imperfect, um, you have no uh, tav at the beginning there. So, But here you do have um, tav in the ending, t. So har uh, harimo harimoti harimoti um in Genesis thirty one forty five uh vai ri meha vai ri meha and then thirty nine fifteen harimoti harimoti and thirty nine eighteen ka harimi ka harimi and forty four forty one forty four lo Yarim, lo yarim. I like the sound of that. Um, Exodus. I just like the sound. Um, Exodus seven twenty. We have vayarem. Uh, and Exodus fourteen eight. Rama. So that's interesting. We know the place name Rama. And then fourteen sixteen. Exodus. Uh, harem, harem. So again, these have to do with uh, exalt, lift it up, rising be set on high, so on and so forth. Um, interesting word. So, yeah, that's it for now. We have a Christ in Classics episode coming up next, so stay tuned for that. Here we go. So, um, we have two special guests here that I'm, I'm really eager to, um, to hear more from. We have Dr. Matthew Bianco from 
the Searcy Institute, and Joe Murphy, founder and director of Trace, a uh, university model school. That, that's correct, right? Yeah. Right. Here in Texarkana, Texas. I'm currently in Texarkana, Texas. Joe is in Texarkana. Dr. Bianco, where are you currently at? I am in Kannapolis, North Carolina. Just outside of Charlotte. Nice. Nice. Yeah. So why don't we just do this? I'll, I'll start off the conversation just with some just basic introductions. So, uh, Dr. Bianco, uh, you work for the Searcy Institute. Um, tell us a little, a little bit about what the Searcy Institute is and what's your role there. Sure. Um, I'm the chief operations officer is my main, my main gig. Um, but I do a lot of teacher training and, and speaking and writing and, uh, professional development training, things like that, uh, based on need. We're small, so we have, everybody wears a lot of hats. Um, the Cersei Institute, <laughs> the Cersei Institute's interesting because it depends who you ask, what we do. Um, for some people, their main interaction with us is through our conference, through our national conference that we just finished on Saturday. And so they think of us as a conference. It's a big conference where people come and learn about classical education. Um, some people come to us through our apprenticeship. And so they think of us as an organization that does teacher training. Uh, some people know of us through our writing curriculum. We have a, homeschool, a curriculum that is used by a lot of homeschoolers and classical schools. And so they think of us as a curriculum organization. What, what do we think of ourselves as? Uh, <laughs> Uh, probably the best way to put it as a, is that we think of ourselves as a research institute where we're trying to do research to figure out what classical education and what Christian classical education particularly really is and then create resources yeah. and training for people to help them do it. That's fantastic. Mm, nice. Yeah, we've had... Um, uh, Andrew Kern on the show uh, a, a few months ago. The his his formal title. He's he's founder and CEO and president. Uh, CEO. There we go. Yeah, of of the Cersei Institute. He's coming back in a couple of weeks to discuss with me um, the last third of Homer's Homer's Odyssey. I'm pretty excited about that. Um, Joe. Tell us about who you are and what you do at, uh, at, at Trace and what Trace is. Yeah. So um, I am not a Texarkana resident. This is my husband's hometown. And um, we moved back to the area just right during COVID. And we had our kids enrolled in a classical school here for all of six weeks before everything shut down. Mm. And our oldest was a sophomore. And um, we had always homeschooled up to that point, but trying to figure out what to do in a small town to help our kids thrive during COVID was a nightmare. And um, just as we had emerging teenagers, it became very clear that for our family, with my husband working um, outside of the home quite a bit, that, um, that they really needed godly men, my sons especially, pouring into them and saying, this is true. This is good. This is beautiful. And so um, Trace kind of evolved out of that. It started with one teacher and just me calling friends and saying, would you be involved in this humanities class if we, if we started this up? And then after that, it was, hey, I think we could do eight classes. And then this is year four, and we're going to have 28 classes. Um, so it is, um, it's paper class and students. It's, um, we, in our home, we have a classical emphasis um, like Dr. Bianco, it's really a work in process of what, what does that mean in the 21st century? I don't know anybody who was educated by Plato. <laughs> um, so trying to figure out how to capture my children's hearts and make sure that their first goal is Christ um, and believing that classical is a good tool to, to point them in that direction, hmm. um, but that we're still trying to figure out what that means for the community. Um, for the homeschooling community here, there's still a lot of misunderstanding for what a classical education is. So we really don't advertise that that is our emphasis. We offer classes that are classical, but then we'll give them, we call rhetoric speech or um, humanities this year is going to be modern Western Civ. Um, so 
people are getting on board with what it is without knowing what it is. And that's just going to be kind of a slow progression in people's minds and hearts. Yeah. I, I mean, one of the, I've got a list of questions here just to kind of lead us. Um, but one of the, I, I, we all, I guess, is, is North Carolina technically considered the South in the United States? I'm, I'm pretty sure, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I'm not sure about the climate where you're at, Dr. Bianca, but here in Northeast Texas and South Eastern Oklahoma, northwestern Arkansas, southwestern Arkansas, this this whole area, it's generally really hard soil for the liberal arts. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's it, schools in general are captivated by the 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 Friday night lights culture. It's driven by a utilitarian mindset that the the chief end of education is to get a good job so that you can make a lot of money and have a good uh, mm -hmm. family with a nice home and, and live comfortably. That. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what, what we're advocating for, I think we could all agree is, is a, is a liberal education, not in a political liberal sense, but in a liberating sense, classical education liberates the human being. Well, from what? Just got off. Just got off a, another episode with, with with the academic dean at Bethlehem College and Seminary, and we'd had this very discussion that the liberal arts liberates you from ignorance and and sin, and mm -hmm. it, it frees us toward true knowledge and true holiness and 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 purity. The the three transcendentals: good, uh, the good, the true, and the beautiful. And that's. And its chief ends are not utilitarian, although it will impact everything that you do with your hands and, and the way that you that, in the way that you think. So, in a really real sense, I think that a classical education is um, <laughs> really utilitarian because it's going to help you do whatever it is you want to do a lot Absolutely. better. Absolutely. So, um, Doctor Bianco, have you have you experienced? Um, Rather, what's your experience? I would assume that you have experience. What's your experience with um, the educational climate uh, in your neck of the woods? Um, I, I don't know. I probably live in a strange community because I, I think that there's a lot of, a lot of the people, at least that I interact with regularly, are people who are already into classical education. So... Every, every, almost everybody at my church does it in some way, shape, or form. Mm -hmm. Some of them teach at classical schools. Some of them homeschool their children classically. Some of them have co-ops. Um, and then obviously at work, I work at Cersei, so I'm just surrounded by people, you know, that that are that, are, that do this. But when I yeah. interact with people who do classical, or when I enter, when I interact with people that are doing cl classical education through my training, like when I'm training people. Uh, I encounter, I encounter, I encounter that people having the kind of problem where it's um, like, I, you know, kind of what you were describing, Joe, that, that it's, how do I, how do I present classical education to people who don't, they don't know the buzzwords, they don't know the language, the terminology, is it important for them to know mm -hmm. the buzzwords language and the terminology? Does yeah. that matter? Right. Um, or, or can I just can I just give them an education that is classical apart from the buzzwords, and and then they just see that this is a really really good education, um, and then you've got kind of on the other side people that are that are um, trying to communicate the value of classical education to people that that well why would I put my kid in a in a in an institution or an organization like that, when that means he's not going to be able to play sports. Um, maybe around here it's basketball. Maybe out where you guys it's football. Um, you know, North Carolina yeah. college basketball, but you know, Texas right. loves its football. Yeah. Um, the you know, so you have that kind of problem, or or on, on the other side of that, like prom and you know all the all the stuff that the parents did. Mm -hmm. They somehow don't want their kids to miss out on. Um, even, well, I'll just leave 
leave aside the even even though part um <laughs> then and then there's this kind of this 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 um kind of reaction too that i've heard that i've heard described of like should i should i pretend in some way that the or that the education i'm going to offer so, so so say some family comes in and says um well you know classical education sounds cool but we want to make sure our kids still have this and they still have that and they still do this and they still do that and they basically describe something that's like a, a hybrid between classical education public education or modern education um and and then the, the school has to respond in one of two ways i think like we the school can either end that it's going to meet all those things like yeah yeah, yeah no, and then hope that the family comes around to seeing that those other things aren't that important um and, and, and pretend that they can be all things to all people or maybe a little bit more of a, of a hardline response and say no if 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 you don't want to make reading the great books the higher value in the in, the, in your the educational life of your child then then we're probably not the right school for you and like you should go where you you should go to a school yeah. that offers what you what yeah. you're looking for you know um and then and then the the good and bad that comes with that response versus the good and bad that comes with the other response. Those are the kinds of things I see when I'm talking to people yeah. in education, training and stuff. <laughs> yeah. So when, when was it, um, was there a particular moment or did you grow up um, in this environment of classical education? Like when did, when were you first, both of you first exposed to classical education? Um, and uh, can you describe the the process of, of of a of a of a switch of a conversion, if you will, if there even was? I, I'm not sure if either of you were were raised in a classical climate. You want to take it, you want to take it first, Joe? Yeah, absolutely. So I grew up in Little Rock public schools. Um, my dad was an educator. My stepmom was an educator. Um, very professional family. Our whole world revolved around the public education. My school clothes were bought with public education. Um, and uh, I grew up just really, just like as a product as of, of the honors program, really coming, like really knowing deep in my core how very special I was and how much I had to offer to the world. And, um, I got to college and, um, I guess like my sophomore year of school, the concept, I didn't know the words, but the concept of the great conversation were just sinking in. And it's really the first time that I began to understand, um, that I had been taught things backwards that, that I, um, that my education started with me and that that was really wrong. And, um, about the same time, um, I came to understand what classical education was. And, um, so I was 1920 and really saying, wow, I missed the boat. I wish, I wish I had had this experience. And, um, so as I'm finishing up my teaching classes and all of that at UCA, I'm really processing. I don't know that I believe what I'm being taught. I really think the way it was done 200 years ago and 500 and 900, the way Western civilization has done it is, is really has a lot more rapport with the kind of student it develops than, um, than what we've seen in the last 70 years. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Dr. Bianco, did you grow up in a classical setting or in, in a typical government funded public school? No. Yeah. I went to public schools my entire life until college. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, I, I, I remember, I remember in high school loving Shakespeare and I remember in high school loving, we had a humanities class where we studied art and um, Shakespeare or stuff like that. And I, I remember loving that class. 
I, I took a I took a year of Latin my freshman year before we moved to I moved to another school that didn't offer Latin, and I remember loving Latin. Uh, but I never I never like when I graduated from high school I didn't think about classical education until until we had kids until right. you know somebody we were homeschooling our kids you know just using box curriculum and you can probably guess which ones and uh and we um and then somebody told me about about dorothy sayers and accs and you know all the different classic mm -hmm. stuff that was out there um and at that point i that was when i when i realized like i like i read that stuff and i was like this stuff makes sense and then I started seeing the books that they were going to be reading, that my kids would be reading in high school if they did mm -hmm. this program. And it was all the books that I that I had loved growing up or, mm -hmm. or wanted to love or wanted to read. Right. Oh, yeah. That I missed out on. Uh, and so it just it just connected. But I never went weird. Even 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 in even growing up loving Shakespeare, I never. After after high school, I never went out in pursuit of it. Like I never pursued looking for where where would this thing be if I was if I was able to create or find what I love. Where would I find it? I never did, I never tried until somebody told me about it. Yeah, similarly, I grew up all uh, I grew up in the public school system, and there were and I was a just an awful student, just completely awful student. Uh, the, the only thing that I really put much effort into was music, and so uh, I went off to college for music. But there were a, there were a couple of books in high school that I remember that um, captivated me that, that that I read in full. Like uh, most books, I didn't read. I just spark noted and I, and I took my D plus or my C minus and went on. And uh, but it was uh, Steinbeck's of Mice and Men one because it was yes. short and two because it cursed a lot. Um, but I but <laughs> but. But I found it, I remember thinking, this is an incredibly profound book, mm -hmm. despite all the cursing. And um, Harper Lee's To Kill a Mockingbird, mm -hmm. uh, both by American authors. And uh, still to this day, I, th those two books, um, read them eight, nine times, and they just keep getting better and better, those yeah. two in particular. And then when I went off to college, Still just an awful student, except for my music studies. I was a pretty good hotshot trumpet player. And, um, but the Lord uh, really gripped my heart my sophomore year in college, and I began to be captivated with the Bible. And that's really when my reading journey began, when I was 19, and then went off to seminary and worked for a, the college that the seminary was at, Bethlehem College and Seminary. While I was in seminary, I was TAing in the college. And it's a liberal arts college. And I saw what they were reading. And I, more importantly, I saw the minds that were being mm -hmm. shaped. Yeah. And I thought, I want that. <laughs> like, right. can I please right. have that? And that's when somebody put Dorothy Sayers' um, uh, Lost Tools of Learning in my hand. And from there, it's just, it's just there's no going back. No going right. back in my, in my heart. Um, uh, so... <clears throat> Classical education, we've talked about it. You've, we've both mentioned, or you've both mentioned homeschooling uh, a, a couple of times. So let's talk about classical Christian education in um, the context of, of, of homeschooling. I think most classical schools, I would be willing to wager, are brick and mortar schools. They're, they have their own building, their own staff. Uh, and, and and so on and so forth. Um, why is homeschooling important? We'll start right there. Real real broad. Yeah. Um, I feel like our reasons for homeschooling are kind of legion. They're um, they're multifaceted. <laughs> for our family, it really started of a nail down. This is kind of what we need. This can be best for our family. We had a different kid. Um, our firstborn is is Spectrum. He's like got this genius IQ, but socially, developmentally, he's just super awkward and weird and has been that way since he like was first speaking. And so trying to figure out how do we love him well? How do we help him understand that God made him on purpose 
for good things. Um, we just wanted a lot of control into mm -hmm. in the time. Um, we wanted prime time in his in his life and pouring that message into him. But once we started, Brian and I both have just kind of had this long trail of, oh, there's another reason. Oh, there's another reason. So we um, we love the prime time discipleship element of teaching our kids. I love it that I live real real time, real life in front of my kids. They see me without makeup. They see me when I'm cranky. They see me when I'm lazy. Um, and I have to repent in front of them. They have to see either mom growing towards Christ or mom not. And that really pushes me forward in my race of faith. So I love that element for myself personally, but I think growing up, my dad was my favorite teacher. I never had him in the classroom, but those are the lessons I remember. I remember the things that he poured into me in the off time. And so there's become this element of, wow, we could have done that all the time. And what would it have looked like? So that's really my personal, like the big pieces of why we do this. My, um, my wife told my, when we, when we first started homeschooling, it was my idea, not my wife's. And my wife did it begrudgingly. Um, and at the end of the year, she had planned all, all the whole way through. She had planned. She was going to do one year and that was it. Kids were going back to school. And at the end of the year, she, um, she registered us to go to, we were living in Maryland at the time. She registered us to go to a Maryland home education, home educators conference, whatever it was, convention. And, and then told me that she had changed her mind or, well, she never told me that she was, that there, her mind needed to be changed. She just, at this point, she, that was when she told me that she had not planned to homeschool them, but had changed her mind. And that she realized that she didn't think she could homeschool the kids long-term because she didn't think she liked them well enough. And after one year of homeschooling them, she realized she liked them. Mm -hmm. and that she wanted to be around them. Um, and, and she's, this is playful. Part of this conversation is playful, you know, like, but, but there's something serious there too. Like she didn't think she could endure them all day long. Mm. They would get on her nerves or whatever. And I'm sure they still, they did. And they still would. They do. They do. They right? do. But, um, but she was, she was able, able to endure that far more than she thought she would be. Right. And that made her want to be around them more. So the mm -hmm. one reason to homeschool is just so that you can realize you like your kids more than you think you might mm -hmm. like your kids. And they like each other. Yeah. That's right. And you. Um, right. Right. The, uh, the second one is a story I heard from a lady. I was doing training for homeschooling uh, for an organization I used to work for before Cersei. And uh, so there's like 200 parents at this training. And this lady comes up to me during one of the breaks and says that she had she homeschooled all of her children except for one because the youngest had uh disabilities and that the teachers at the school like she put the, the child in the school because there were professionals there who were able to deal with these disabilities and she wouldn't be able to she put her daughter in the school and then the school came to her, the teachers came to her and said, look, this, the, this, the school has, I, I think this is something that President Obama started, some sort of like three strikes and you're out kind of thing where like, if you fail some sort of checkpoints along the way, you get moved from one kind of like standard education track to like a career training track mm -hmm. um, where they don't bothered teaching you things outside of what you need for like daily life and career. And so the daughter was, was about to hit her third strike and was going to get moved over to this other track. And so they were telling her about this and she said, well, what are you going to do to prevent that? And they said, we're not going to do it. We can't do anything. We don't have time to do that. Mm -hmm. That's, you've got to do that. So now she's wondering, wait, why am I, why did I put my daughter with the professionals, but the professionals don't even have time to help her. Mm -hmm. And so she took her daughter home or she was at home with her daughter that night and she was practicing spelling words with one of her other children that 
she was homeschooling. And so she had this whiteboard and she had um, the words written on the board or something. I can't remember. And she was asking the daughter, of the older daughter, what uh, to like pick the word that she was saying. And, and she noticed the youngest daughter, the handicapped daughter's eyes were following the words on the board. And so she stopped and she asked the younger daughter to erase or point to the word that she said. Um, and the daughter was able to do it. Mm -hmm. And, and what, what was happening was that in the school, the school's entire assessment program was based on uh, verbal communication, verbal skills, ex external verbal skills. And the daughter couldn't, that was her disability. She had a verbal processing disability or something. Uh, but she, so, so in, inside of her head, she understood everything that was going on around her, but she couldn't express it verbally. Mm -hmm. And so she was incapable of, of, of a good education, a good education. Um, but the, but the, the, the reality in this situation was that the mother of this group of people, the mother was the only one who could love the daughter enough to mm -hmm. slow everything down. And be patient mm -hmm. to figure this out, and the school couldn't do that. They, I mean, like, I, I'm not even, I'm not even questioning whether a teacher can love her students. I'm just saying, this, these teachers didn't have time to love their students in the way that mm -hmm. the mother. And so this daughter is, was now going to be able because the mother ended up pulling her out to homeschool her. This mother was now, or this daughter was now going to be able to get a quality education simply because the mother could slow everything down enough out mm -hmm. of love her daughter to make that possible. And, and the school was never going to be able to do that. Um, that's a that's a pretty big deal. And then the third, sorry, I'll just say one third reason. So so one reason is so that you can know that you like your children, <laughs> and and they like and that they like each other and that they like you. And two, because they need your love in teaching them. Uh, the third one though is something that you you touched on, Joe, which is that they the our children teach us humility in ways that is absolutely essential to our growing to be more like Christ and theirs. And like, it's one thing for me to commit a sin and then repent when my pastor preaches a sermon on it mm -hmm. uh, or, or when my wife addresses it, but it's a completely other thing when a mm -hmm. seven year old confronts me. Right. On it. Absolutely. And, you know, the humility that it, that gets drawn out of me, um, if I respond properly, if I respond properly, the humility and the, and the repentance that can be drawn from me is so much richer and deeper and more Christ-like than, than, um, can, what can happen, you know, than maybe what happens with, with the other folks, uh, and, and having your children around seeing you to, to borrow your words, Joe, with no makeup on and being lazy and, you know, all of this stuff, um, and just to have them experiencing that with you day in and day out. And then to be able to say, Daddy, you're not supposed to yell at people or whatever. Um, that's love that's is patient. Yeah, big, right. Big. Mm. So yeah, that's good. I so um, I've I was never homeschooled. I've never homeschooled. My children are not homeschooled. But I can't help but like when I think of the role of a parent. God has required all of us to raise our children. And so the, 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 the usual Greek term for instruction, paideia, um, encompasses not just like a, an imparting of, of knowledge, right. but, but, a, but a personal shepherding, if you, if, if you will. And so it's a, ch choosing a school or how your child is going to be educated is no light matter. And I can't help but but think that if if a family's able and capable of of homeschooling in a in a sense that seems to be in my mind a uh, an ideal nearly perfect scenario if 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 you if you're um I I know certain families who who would like to to homeschool um, but perhaps, uh, well, one is a, one's a widow and, and she, she has to, she has to work, um, mm -hmm. or, 
other sorts of financial strains where the kids have to go to school for whatever reason. But how how fulfilling it it, it must be to, as a parent, to be home with your kids and to instruct them really well. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I do have a question for 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 um, well, actually, two questions. Uh, I know a little bit about your kids, Joe. Dr. Bianco, how are your kids um, out of the nest, or are they still in school? Gone. They wow. My oldest is working on his master's degree, has a wife and three kids. My middle child is uh, moving to the other side of the world in a couple of months, um, like literally to the country of Georgia. Um, oh, wow. wow. In, in September. My youngest is at Hillsdale getting her master's degree there in classical education. Yeah, they're all gone. So were they, were they, um, were they homeschooled all the way through their... Um... Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, my oldest, we started homeschooling him in third grade. Okay. And then my young, my middle son went to kindergarten at a public school for like, I don't know, two months before we pulled him out. So we pulled him and the older two months into kindergarten and third grade. And then the youngest was always homeschooled right to the end. Yeah. Okay. Nice. Nice. So Joe, you said in 2020, you came to picture Canada. Uh, around that time, mm-hmm. and you and you put your kids in the only classical Christian mm-hmm. school that was in the city. It's no longer around, unfortunately. What was your decision to um, transition from homeschooling to put them in a in a really s- small classical Christian school? Yeah, um, you know, for me, that particular school was always the goal eventually, and homeschooling was kind of the thing that the Lord kept saying. But no, actually, this is the way I want you to disciple your kids. But no. And so every step of the way, Veritas was always the next step, always from the time he was born. That's where he was going to go. And the Lord just one year at a time said, no, 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 no. So um, when we moved here, though, I really thought, okay, this is it. This is when we're really going to do this. And for me, um, I've seen so many homeschooling, so many homeschooled men get angry. Um, And it's, and it's like the, I'm trying to word this well. I did not want the link to my apron strings to inhibit their perception of the good things. Um, I wanted other people pouring into them. And so I really felt very strongly that high school was the right time Hmm. for that to happen. Um, That I wanted godly men and women saying, no, really what your mom and dad have taught you. That's it. That is, that is it. Um, And I Hmm. knew with my boys and I'm finding out as well with my girls, they need those voices as they hit that logic stage, as they hit that rhetoric stage and they're saying, what do I really believe? And are really, there's a big element with my kids. Maybe it's just us, but um, there's this piece of my parents aren't as smart as, as they think they are. And um, I, I didn't know that that would come from homeschooling, but it t- absolutely has. And so for them to have local um, local men and women who have loved the Lord well, with all of their heart, soul, mind, and strength to come along beside us and say, this is worth pursuing. This is who you want to be. That's why we wanted to transition them into uh, uh, Veritas initially. And it's why we have our program today. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So so, uh, along these lines, what are, what are some, some of the pros and cons, um, some blessings and maybe some hurdles to both um, educating in the home and educating in a in a brick and mortar uh, mm-hmm. environment. Doctor Bianca, what do you think? Uh, well, I I think you just touched on the key the key point, right? That our children. Uh, 
our children need to grow past us Mm -hmm. Um, to be independent, to be adults, to be on their own. They need to learn how to, they need to learn. They need to experience the world apart from us, away from us, Mm -hmm. beyond us. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the most common mistakes that parents make with their children is holding the, the reins too tight for too long. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. And figuring out where that time, that cutoff point is, and and honestly, the cutoff point is always earlier than we think it is. But mm-hmm. you can imagine it being that young, like you can't imagine right. thinking, "Oh, right. I got my thirteen-year-old make decisions and suffer the consequences." Um, right. When yeah. I can protect him from those consequences, especially if the consequences are bad. Um, but probably it is something like they're twelve or thirteen years old. I don't know. Uh, I mean, mm-hmm. I don't know because I didn't do it. I waited till my kids were way older before. I mean, I was I was the the controlling parent, really. Um, my wife was, uh, you know, far more chill, and uh, <laughs> and I was like, you know, they're eighteen years old, and I'm still trying to arrange marriages for them or something, you know. Um, so, and anyways, the the putting them into a school with other teachers is a big deal. Right. So other people can pour into them, but also because other people are willing to let them make mistakes. Mm-hmm. Moms and dads are mm-hmm. not. And the other thing, too, is um, there's a sense in which, you know, I don't know. I don't know what uh, we haven't we haven't and maybe we don't need to talk about different faith traditions. But the um, I just want to say something about I'm not a Baptist, but I want to say something about Baptist that I think is very interesting. Um, Baptists have this, have this, uh, this, this theological position, right? That the child needs to make a commitment to Christ for himself. And that's when he gets baptized, right? When, when he has, when he has that, 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 um, salvation experience, whatever, then he gets baptized Mm -hmm. and there's a, a, an outward expression of the internal, the internal commitment, internal change. Um, and I come from a tradition where they, we baptize them like as soon as, you know, as soon as they're, as soon as they cut the umbilical cord, like right there, sprinkle them water. I'm just kidding. But it's very young. And the, uh, and the thing that, the thing that, that, that the Baptists, I think, are helping us to see is um, children, children, especially home, especially homeschool children will grow up in in their homeschool environment and they'll not know do I believe that, do I believe x because it's true or do I believe x because if I don't mom will spank me or whatever right do I, do I believe x because it's true or do I believe x because mom and dad told me to and it's not it's not some like sometimes they're consciously asking that question but it's not something that they can consciously uh disconnect they can't separate those two things out and see this comes from mom this comes from the truth um and and so so the longer they're homeschooled the longer they're gonna have to spend trying to figure that out uh the longer they're gonna have to un- unpack all of that but this weird thing happens where when you put them into a school and a, and mrs smith tells them that x is something even though Mrs. Smith has the authority to discipline them for not accepting X, which, which might mean like you got a C on your paper instead of an A, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Um, Even though Mrs. Smith still has some sense of like, some sense of controlling their beliefs, they don't, they don't confuse those two things. They know I, I believe this thing because I, I believe it to be true or I believe this thing because Mrs. Smith is making me at this moment. Somehow they can separate those two things with Mrs. Smith, but they can't do it with mom and dad. And so mm-hmm. putting the teacher into or putting the student into a school mm-hmm. at some point, could the, the 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 huge blessing that could come from that is, and Joe, you just said it too, is that some other adult is coming along and saying, What your mom and dad taught you is right. Even though they don't have to say those words, right? They're just mm-hmm. reinforcing it. Mm-hmm. And as soon as somebody else comes along and says that, the student like a light bulb. now separate those two things mm-hmm. out and say, I believe yeah. that's true, not because mom and dad are making me. 
Oh yeah, yeah, and and especially so if it's a classical Christian school where Mrs. Smith is on your team. Mrs. Mm -hmm. Smith can and 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 should, as a good teacher, play the devil's advocate and say, "Well, what if Y is true and not X?" And here are some good reasons to to entertain this possibility that Y is true. One, two, three. What do you say to that? Where your your your, your child now is engaging with an opposing view that's counter to your worldview, but it's still necessary and important to wrangle through all those reasons. And Mrs. Smith is on your side and wants the best for you and isn't um, uh, 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 destructive, we'll just say. It's, it's, um, you're, 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 she's not trying to deconstruct everything that mom and dad has instilled in you. Um, that's good. That's good. I, so I, um, I'm in a, I'm in a unique scenario where we're in Texarkana. Um, like I, I was teaching at a classical charter school in, in the Frisco, in the Frisco area. And we moved to Texarkana and there's, there's no classical school here. And so, uh, my clip, my, my kids go to, uh, an elementary school that's pretty pretty high ranking it's it's um uh it mm -hmm. prioritizes certain things that i wouldn't necessarily prioritize in education and so there's a lot of my kids coming home and saying hey dad we're doing this we're doing this or hey my teacher said this but you've taught us this and so those have proven to be um uh, fruitful conversations sometimes frustrating because I would I would rather not not have had them being exposed to um, certain things for the first time for that regard, but but it's not like detrimental things like uh, mm -hmm. so like for for example like my boy comes home the other day and is like Dad, you said God created the world in in six days, but my teacher is saying certain things. Like like dinosaurs roamed the earth thirty two million years ago. Well, how old is the earth? It's like well, <laughs> and so we have that we have that conversation, and and that's and that's nice, but um, I'm still craving and and, and wanting them to have uh, all all of their education being sifted through the a, a biblical worldview because if if it's not sifted through a biblical worldview, it's sifted through some other worldview, whether or not uh, the school is pretending to be neutral there's no such thing as an unbiased education there's uh it's it's just a responsible with its convictions and its worldview or i i would probably just say irresponsible with or ignorant of its of its own reasonings and philosophies that undergird how they present um and and, and package education in general oh so i got a question for, for you guys too as, as homeschooling parents um what I would imagine the role of athletics and the arts are a little bit more challenging to exercise than in a brick and mortar school. Um, if that's true, I, I would say, I, my question is, uh, um, how did you guys address the topic of athletics and, and arts? But if it's not true, tell me, talk about, talk about why. I will say that in a homeschooling setting today, even in a small town like Texarkana, that's very different than it was maybe even 10 years ago. Um, athletics, especially with club sports, um, as much as a parent wants their child to be involved, they can be involved. Um, we work really hard with balance, with activities. Um, that's incredibly important to us. We make our kids choose. Um, if they're interested in the arts, there's a little bit more flexibility with that. Um, but, but especially with sports and things, I have one that wants to swim and wants to do gymnastics and wants to do ballet. And we've just had to say, we can do this one. We can't do this one. If you want to do this one, you have to give up this one. And, um, so making sure that it has its proper place, I would say, is more of the struggle than 
them making sure it's present. Does does Trace offer um, any avenues for those kinds of uh, activities? Like oh, through yeah, Trace itself? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So athletics will be offering our first program this year, and it's going to be just a cross country team. Um, wow. We actually have a student um, transitioning from your school and the, um, the mom is, is wanting that to continue to be a part of, of his journey. So she's going to be heading up and we're excited about that. As far as the arts, um, I do think that's very important. And so um, we offer a really top notch choir program where kids are learning to read music. They're learning to sing harmony. Um, they're learning. They have like, we had this great magical feast that kind of incorporated what we were doing as far as history, as well as the musical nice. element. Um, and then as far as like more applied arts, more art, uh, like painting, sculpting, drawing, those kinds of things, that's a little bit more tricky depending on what teachers are available um, I'd like to see that further develop as we grow. Yeah, I don't, I don't know what we did. Um, I think, I mean, I remember we put our, our kids did sports like homeschool football league was around here. Mm -hmm. The homeschool rugby, mm -hmm. it wasn't a homeschool rugby league, just a rugby league um, and baseball, uh, little league baseball, stuff like that. They did over the years here and there. Um, I don't, for me though, I, I did a, I did a talk at a conference a, few, a couple of years ago that's called, um, why the gym, why the gym teacher is the most important teacher in your school. And, uh, so I don't, I think that the athletic component is super important, but I don't necessarily mean like team sports, although, I mean, I know team sports have their value. Um, but there's something about make teaching children to say yes to hard things. Absolutely. And no to, to easy, comfortable, pleasurable things that is part of the gymnastic or the gym mm -hmm. experience. I, I remember I read a study maybe 15 years ago that came out about homeschoolers that, that most homeschoolers, according to the study, most homeschoolers, and I don't remember what the number was, if it was 51% or 67% or whatever, but it was most homeschoolers counted playground time as their, as their, you know, physical education time. And in the, the person who was sharing the study was saying how problematic that is because most children on the playground will not do something that's hard for them. Mm -hmm. They'll go on the stuff that's easy. And, um, and so they're not, you're, they're not getting the, the necessary aspect of the push, yeah. the push right. Of the, the, the gymnastics training comes from. So in the classical world, Plato, Aristotle, you know, Socrates, they right. went to the gymnasium every day mm -hmm. for their education. And, and that, and part of that education was saying yes to hard things, do more push ups, do more laps or whatever they were doing, you know, and then. Uh, and then saying no to pleasurable things like there was there were food restriction rules like fasting kind of stuff that they had to they had to submit to that um, I think are are essential components to to teaching the child to be able to say yes and no to the right things at the right time and uh, that that might be missing I. Think might be missing from a lot of schools or, or might be under prioritized or something. And then on, on the art side of it, I think a similar argument can be made from the ancients to the classical world too, that, well, there's a dialogue, one of Plato's dialogues in which the main character, who, it's not Socrates in this particular case, but it's a guy like Socrates. He says that a person is not educated if they cannot sing and dance. Um, that they need to be able to make their voice match the, the notes mm. and they need to be able to control the, their bodies and have like fine motor skill control over their bodies. And that, 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 that is what it means to be educated. Um, now there's a context in which he's saying that, but nonetheless, that it's an important part of important part of education in the classical world. And I think it needs to be an important part of education in our world so 
a, a, a choir class for every for every grade or every school, you know, where the the everybody's singing in the choir together. Um, St. John's College in Annapolis, Maryland, has a freshman choir, and it's a it's a mandatory class for every freshman it has to be in the choir. Mm -hmm. Much to the much to the choir teacher's chagrin, perhaps that not every he does you might not want every voice on that platform. <laughs> Right. And they're doing it, but nonetheless, that's part of what they have to do. And I think that would be a good, uh, a good thing for every homeschool or every classical school or whatever. To yeah. At my old school, when I taught uh, at the classical school in Frisco, I'm currently not at a classical school, but when I taught at a classical school, I was really pleased, especially with my undergrad being in music, uh, that, um, it was a core class mandatory for every student in the sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. So in that in that logic phase, they all had to either take uh, wind band or orchestra or, or like like band like uh, wind instruments and percussions or orchestra um, string the, the string orchestra. So by the time they got to high school, uh, every student was competent in their in, in music literacy. Uh, they they were musically literate. They could read music and they could translate that music on those foreign symbols through an instrument, whatever that instrument might might be. And that was just their um, their uh, uh, approach to saying music is central to education. And I think even athletics uh, is, is too physical in, engagement. It's I, mm -hmm. I consider it like in the in the arts. So much that whenever I watch like the, the NBA championship or the World Ser Series or the Super Bowl, oh, well, all of which I haven't really watched in full for some years now. But whenever I watch sports, <laughs> um, I, I'm not super interested in who's going to win. I'm super interested in the competition because in the, in, in the heated pressure of going back and forth, those athletes are doing some pretty incredible things. That's beautiful to watch. Mm -hmm. Like, um, like, uh, and, and it's an art and it's an art, but like, I mm -hmm. think like all things, it's got to be properly ordered in, in, in the educational scheme, the ordo amores, mm -hmm. the order of love. Um, and, um, so I, I would imagine it would be a little bit more difficult for homeschoolers to, uh, incorporate that just because there's not as much resource. When you, you get put into a brick and mortar school, it's like, oh, we have an orchestra already set up. You can choose the class, second period. But with homeschools, I, I, there's there's less resources to draw from, and you'd have to get a little bit more creative. It looks like Joe with with Trace, this this uh, uh, university model, it's it's growing, and so you're like creating a context for for all these things to like happen and and, and grow. It's exciting to hear that there's a cross country team coming up. Um. This has been a really, a really interesting conversation uh, coming from two individuals that I'm that I'm looking at right now. Uh, I don't know you. I, I, I know Joe uh, a little bit, Dr. Bianco. I don't know you really at all, but just knowing a little bit of your backgrounds, um, Dr. Bianco's kids are, are are out of the nest and and living their their own lives and taking their own pursuits as the Lord leads them. Um, Joe's kids are are a little younger and still kind of in the in the thick of education right now. But but both homeschooling uh, parents, um, it's 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 encouraging to me um, that that uh, well let me just say like growing up like there was always a stigma with with homeschooling it's like well it, 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 if the student is homeschooled he's not going to be socially um, capable. He, he's going to miss out on all these opportunities that they, they can get at the ISD down the street. He's going to be, he's going to be weird and, and an oddball, but everything that I've heard you guys say is like the exact opposite. It's like, no, he's, the, the child is going to be, is going to be more of a human and, uh, and, and in many ways that then, um, what a brick and mortar school can, uh, can offer. It'd be really beautiful to see brick and mortar classical schools linking arms with local homeschooling co-ops and, and, and communities and, and working together in, in, in various ways. Um, so I'm really encouraged and I'm really thankful that you guys uh, have decided to come on for uh, an hour just to, just, just to discuss this.
Thank you. So, yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Well, um, I think that's all that I got, unless you have okay. everything else. Nope. nope. Very good. Thank you very much. All right. Well, okay. Joe, Dr. Bianco, God bless. All right. Thanks, Thanks. you all as right. well. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Interested in growing your ancient language skills but not sure where to start? Glow's House can help. From illustrated readers and short stories to lexicons and grammars, Glossa House offers a variety of resources for beginning, intermediate, and experienced ancient language learners. Head to glossahouse.com today. Glossa House, language resources for the global community.